On today's episode, the end of NASA's moon mission, a progress report from SpaceX's Starship, and China's sample return sets a date. America's exploration of the moon has come to an end, for now at least. The Firefly Aerospace Blue Ghost lander signed off with a final transmission on March 16th, ending 14 days of continuous operation on the lunar surface. In a mission that Firefly has dubbed fully successful, with Blue Ghost achieving 100% of its mission objectives since touching down on March 2nd. For its final operation, Blue Ghost photographed the sunset over the lunar horizon. Beyond the artistic value, these images were taken to examine solar influences on the lunar dust. Specifically, they're looking to see if the dust levitates at sunset, creating a horizon glow that was observed by NASA astronaut Eugene Cernan on Apollo 17, the final crewed mission to the moon. Following the sunset, Blue Ghost continued to operate for five hours into the lunar night and kept taking pictures until its battery ran out. Blue Ghost also had the opportunity to take a very unique photograph of the Earth. If you saw the Blood Moon eclipse last week, here's what that event looked like from the opposite perspective. A solar eclipse created by the Earth passing between the sun and the moon. In total, Blue Ghost was able to transmit more than 119 gigabytes of data back to the Earth, including 51 gigabytes of science and technology data. This significantly exceeded the lander's mission requirements. Speaking of endings, we've now got final word on the intuitive machine's Athena lander, which tried and failed to land on the moon's South Pole region last week. The company has revealed that Athena's vision system worked as expected during the landing attempt, with the onboard software being able to recognize craters even in the shadowy terrain. The problem happened when the lander couldn't tell how far it was above the surface. Intuitive Machine's laser altimeter had failed on descent. As a result, the privately built spacecraft struck the lunar surface on a plateau, toppled over, and then began to skid across the surface. As it did, the lander rotated at least once or twice before coming to a stop in a small shadowed crater. CEO Steve Altemis described it as, the landing was kind of like sliding into second base. Because Athena skidded across the lunar surface, it kicked up a lot of dust along the way. When it came to a stop, that dust cloud settled down on top of the probe's solar panels. This, combined with ending up sideways in the shadow of a crater where the temperature was around negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit, led to a situation where Athena couldn't power both its heater and its communication system at the same time. So the Intuitive Machines team made a tough call. Instead of dragging out the limited battery life over 50 hours of low power operation, they went for 13 hours of sending as much data as the crippled probe could muster. During this time, the lander was able to accomplish some of its objectives. The lander extended NASA's Trident drill, though it couldn't actually reach the surface, while private customers including Nokia and Lone Star Data Holdings were able to get some useful information from their payloads. But Lunar Outpost was not able to deploy its small rover, and an innovative hopper vehicle could not be fired up to roam across the moon. So what comes next? Well, we know that Firefly is already gearing up for Blue Ghost Mission 2. This is scheduled for launch in 2026 and will push the company's technology even further with a landing on the moon's far side. To accomplish this, Firefly will stack Blue Ghost on top of their Elytra Dark Orbital Vehicle. As for Intuitive Machines, in theory they have an IM-3 mission slated for launch as early as October 2025, and this would be using the same Nova C landing platform as the previous two crash landings. The third mission is set to land at Rainer Gamma, home to an anomaly known as the Lunar Swirl. This is closer to the moon's equator, so in theory it should be much easier than landing near the South Pole, and that might give Intuitive Machines enough confidence to go ahead with a round three. In the meantime, we are still waiting for the arrival of Japan's resilience lander on the lunar surface. Developed by the private firm iSpace, the Japanese payload was launched on the same Falcon 9 rocket as Blue Ghost, but resilience opted to take a much longer and low energy approach to the moon, so it won't actually get there until early June. 
Much like intuitive machines, iSpace is looking to bounce back from a previous landing failure. The Hakuto R experienced a guidance computer error and smashed into the lunar surface at high speed in 2023. Assuming that resilience makes it down in one piece, it's then going to deploy five scientific payloads, one piece of anime memorabilia, and one tiny red house. We'll talk about that a bit more when the landing date finally arrives. While we wait though, let's check in on SpaceX and their ongoing Starship rocket program, which from what we can see appears to be moving ahead at full steam, with the construction of two new Starship upper stage vehicles reaching completion. Typically, this would be great news, but given the fact that we've seen the previous two Starship launch attempts end with explosive failures of the upper stage, it's a bit weird that SpaceX is continuing to go about business as usual. The first is ship number 35, which is the latest vehicle off their assembly line, and will be the launch candidate for the upcoming Flight 9 which Elon Musk believes will happen in about four weeks from now. The ship was first spotted back in October 2024 and has been the fastest ship so far to complete stacking of the stainless steel rings that make up the next gen upper stage. Interestingly, ship 35 is the first ship built with a slimmer but hopefully more resilient heat shield tile that drastically reduces the mass of the rocket which is all well and good, but as we saw on Flight 8, the ship design is clearly not adequate to reach orbit, or even survive to the end of its ascent burn without catching fire and blowing up, which means some modifications are still needed. 35 will at the very least need an upgrade to its plumbing system before being certified for flight, which in theory calls for some major retrofitting. Regardless, SpaceX has gone ahead with cryo-proofing of their new rocket. The ship was filled three times with cryogenic liquid nitrogen, once in the upper methane tank, once in the lower oxygen tank, and then finally once together. This proves that the ship is capable of carrying super-chilled propellants without breaking under the intense pressure. The test appeared to go well, and the ship was quickly returned to Mega Bay 2. This construction facility is where Ship 35 will receive its wing flaps and Raptor engines before rolling out for final testing. Meanwhile, we're also keeping an eye on Starship Booster number 14. If you're keeping track, this is the same rocket that lifted Flight 7 in January of this year, and Elon Musk has said that he wants to reuse this booster on Flight 9, which would make it the first Starship booster to attempt a second launch. In theory, all that the Super Heavy needs is a little refurbishment, and then it will be ready to take Ship 35. The ultimate goal for the Starship booster is to launch multiple times per day, so this would be a significant milestone in the development process to begin reuse, while also adding yet another element of danger to the upcoming Flight 9. While space exploration seems to be making a comeback in the United States, there's another country that seems to be competing in the industry. China has finally announced the date for their Mars sample return mission. The United States has had their own Mars sample return planned for a long time now. They've collected the samples with their Perseverance rover, and there's a plan being made right now to go up there and get them, but it's unlikely to happen before the end of this decade. Meanwhile, China has a new plan that will take place in a mere three years. Set for 2028, the Tianwen-3 mission will feature both an orbiter and a lander, designed for retrieving and returning soil from the Martian surface. The lander will be equipped with an ascent craft, which will be the connecting piece between itself and the orbiter. The mission, which was officially announced a few years ago, has been mostly shrouded in mystery due to its confidential aspect. That was until March 11th, when all of this changed. It went from being a solely Chinese mission to being open to global cooperation. The Chinese stated that they want other companies to help with both the system of the craft as well as the payload, which could help them meet their 2028 goal, since more mines help to speed things up. They also revealed that there would be about 15 kilograms of Martian material that would be available for other countries to study. What would this mean for those other countries though? Well, for one, getting samples from another planet would be revolutionary and worth studying for any nation. 
We aren't sure if the US could theoretically join in on this due to tensions and regulations between the two countries, but if so, it could help to relieve some of the pressure to get to both the moon and Mars faster than the Chinese party. Only time will tell how this mission shapes up, but it certainly has potential to become a historic event.